So first off, if you could kind of explain for our listeners what Little Shops of, Shop of Physics is, how did it start, you know, where did the name come from, that sort of thing. So years ago, there was a thing at CSU that was called Little Shop of Physics, and it was part of this one-time event we did every year um, called Physics Bowl. And Physics Bowl was teams of high school students being asked questions and competing against each other in the clock, and it was a single elimination tournament. Oh, wow. And, and, and so people would come up from Grand Junction, be wiped out by 930. And then we had this room full of like stuff from our lecture demonstration room that was set up that people could just go play with some cool stuff. And um, it was called Little Shop of Physics. And then at some point I got put in charge of that. And um, I decided what I really I, I wanted to do was to have some stuff which wasn't intended for demonstrations, but was really intended for hands-on exploration. And so I started working with some graduate students and some undergraduate students to build things. And then a couple of the students I was working with were excited to have us take it to the schools. So like we really should visit some K-12 schools and show this with some students. And at the time, I'd been doing lecture demonstration shows for schools. And it was really clear what kids wanted and what they needed was not to watch me do cool stuff. They needed to do this stuff themselves. They needed to be the ones who were exploring with a group of undergraduate students at CSU and we just built stuff and put things in cardboard boxes and threw them in the back of my Volkswagen van and started going to schools. And then it kind of grew organically from there. And so these days, in a typical year, what we would do is we would visit 30 to 40 K-12 schools. We would set up tables in a gymnasium and in another room where we could have things be dark and we would set up 120 hands-on science experiment stations. Wow. And I would have, you know, half a dozen CSU undergraduate students who would be walking around in their brightly colored tie-dye t-shirts, just um, helping facilitate. So the kids would just run from table to table and they're, they're, they're trying things out and they're exploring things and seeing what happens and the CSU students are there to serve as guides not to teach people things, but just to kind of like help them learn. And it turns out um, that's a really effective way to teach people science. Like kids um, are very social and they're very curious and just giving them a room full of amazing things that they can explore, they can experiment with, they can try anything they want, they've got all this freedom and then they've got support if they run into a snag or if they have a question. And it's a really effective way to teach people things. So we hope to show schools not only, um, this is a whole bunch of really cool stuff, but here's also a way you can think about teaching science. Give your kids some freedom. Um, let them uh, develop their own ideas. Let them develop their own procedures. Let them develop their own conclusions and see what they come up with. And we had some great data that shows this works really, really well. So we're selling not just the experience, but then for schools to say, you should think about teaching science this way. Science is a process, it's not a body of facts. And we, uh, we also have, we had a television show, local television show for a while. We've got a, uh, workshops we do with teachers. We have this big event we do on CSU campus every year where we set up 300 plus things, invite people from other departments. We have 10,000 people come and visit. It's all hands-on, it's exploratory. And the trick is, Right now, um, we can't do that. I mean, the Little Shop of Physics yeah. is like, if you were to design a super spreader event, <laughs> that's what you would design. <laughs> because the kids are just zipping around the room and they're just talking to their friends and everybody's touching the same stuff and everybody's close and they're putting their eyes up against things, they're putting things over their heads. It's like, this is not going to work. So this year has been a bit of a challenge. Sure. Have you found that you're doing more kind of virtual events with that as far as like maybe Zoom or, or something like that? Yeah, we have. We, we've had to go a lot more virtual and, we, and we're doing um, three different levels of things. And one is um, we send a group of uh, a box of equipment to a location. Mm -hmm. And we've been working with the boys and girls clubs because they have been in person throughout. Oh, wow. Um, so we send a box of stuff to the boys and girls club. They open it up. Kids get things to work with. And then we have a group of CSU students here and they're all Zooming with groups of students at the Boys and Girls Club and saying like, hey, go ahead and pick this thing up. What do you think this does? And then again, they're just letting the kids explore, explain what they're seeing. Um, and then they just explore together. And it's really great because we get to have some of that interaction between the CSU students and the K-12 students. And that's another piece of the puzzle. 
that is uh, really important to me, that the CSU students have the chance to have some a genuine, uh, an opportunity to make a connection with the younger kids, as well as do some service. And the younger kids get a chance to see that, you know, being a science student, thinking about being a scientist, it's not that intimidating. Scientists can co come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and they look a lot of different ways. And, and they see these uh, CSU students, and we have a real diverse crop of students who, who work with us on this. And they really, it's empowering for the students to, to see like, hey, here's someone who's not that much older than me. And they seem like they know a lot of stuff, and they're taking me seriously, and they're listening to me and they're telling me I can do this, it's kind of awesome. That's amazing. And what a, I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, but your students who are working with the younger kids, they probably get way more fulfilled coming out of it and feel just really empowered. Oh yeah. Yeah, one of the things that people say going in is they say like, I'll tell them like, I need to be a role model with these young kids. And they're saying like, uh, oh, I'm not sure I can do that. That's a lot of pressure. And they're done and they're like, they really looked up to me. They, they, they thought what I was doing was amazing. And um, it changes the way they think about themselves. And that is really neat to be able to see. Absolutely. So I do know you traveled to Africa with mm -hmm. Little Shops of Physics. How did that come about? And, and what was kind of the process going through that? Oh, gosh. Going to Africa was really fascinating. And the first time I went to Africa was in 2001, actually. Um, it's fascinating. And we, we have been traveling to schools for a while. We've been traveling to schools for about a decade and, our, and doing workshops with teachers. And our focus was on low-cost science instruction, but also, too, um, science instruction that was completely learner-centered. It was completely constructivist. It was, uh, we, we wanted to show teachers how they could do that. But they, we had to show them how to do it with low-cost materials because here in the United States, um, you know, schools are not always really well funded, particularly a lot of the areas we're trying to target, um, the Denver public schools who work with a lot of schools and reservation areas, they don't have a lot of resources. So we developed a lot of techniques for teaching science with really, really simple tools. And then somebody approached me and said like, hey, I'm working with schools in Ethiopia and funding, if you think funding is a problem here, um, you can't even imagine how it is over there, they just have nothing. So you have ways of kind of like using low-cost local materials to teach science. Would you come over and do some workshops with some teachers in Ethiopia? And so I went over to Ethiopia and did some workshops there, and that was wow, awesome. That was really awesome. And then after that, that kind of like started us on this process of working um, with schools in different countries. Really fascinating because it gave us, we always treat it as an exchange, like we're going to visit you and you're going to teach us um, some things based on how do you view science, how do you teach science, how do you interact with your students. We're going to see what you do. We'll bring some things home and then we'll show you some things that we've learned. And so it's been this great exchange. And in recent years, we've had this connection with schools in Namibia. Wow. Um, it has been great and really, really good. And we've been We've been to Namibia three times. We've had people from Namibia come here and work with us. We have really good contact with the people there, and we're just sharing ideas. We'll say, like, here's something awesome, which we're trying, and we find this is an effective way to teach kids about static electricity. Why don't you try it out? See what you add to this. Um, communicate with us. Um, and that's been really good. That's wonderful. And as far as just kind of a broader impact, how have you seen like Little Shop of Physics change the way people think about physics? The main thing that we see, and actually we've got some really good data about this too. Um, we were part of this NSF funded effort for a decade where we did a lot of, we had access to some people who helped us do some really thoughtful um, investigation as to how we were able to change attitudes of students and teachers. And what we found is going in, students didn't really know what physics was, but it sounded scary. And they knew it was science, they thought science was scary, and it was something that they didn't think that they would be able to do. And we were able to show that when we were done, we, we would visit a school, and even just for an hour visiting a school, we could affect kids' attitudes. And they, they felt like science was interesting, 
something that they thought they might want to do and something they thought they could do. And so we really increased particularly their self-efficacy, uh, thinking like this is something that we could do. And we were able to sort of show similar gains with teachers. And, and with teachers, we really hit that self-efficacy hard because mostly who we work with is teachers in elementary school because it's really clear that students develop their attitudes towards science early, like grades four through six. That's when their, their attitudes towards the sciences are developing. And if during that e age, they think science is difficult, it's confusing, it's nerdy, it's for different kinds of people than me, it's really hard to combat that later. So we, and they get those messages from their teachers. Um, and and, and, I, and I, I, I've been in schools and I've seen like a teacher will say like, oh, it's science time. Oh, this is kind of complicated. This is kind of hard. So I'm going to turn it over to this like specialist that's going to teach you. And it's like, man, we, what you need you to do is we want you to come in and say, it's science time. Science is awesome. I love this stuff. Like, I don't know it all, but doggone it, we're going to find this stuff out together. And we want to teach us to be enthusiastic. So we worked really hard to target particularly elementary school teachers and say science is just awesome. And you don't have to have all the answers. What you have to have is the confidence to ask the questions and let the kids ask the questions and do investigations and see what you discover. Um, and so we really focused on getting materials in teachers' hands where they can teach science that way. And we've had a real impact um, in teachers' willingness to do that and their belief that they can do that. And that's been really amazing to see. That's awesome. And like, what a what an interesting way to come at it from both sides, you know, not just the students, but also the teachers oh, yeah. as well. No, that the, sounds the, wonderful. The, the students are, are like the... Basically, there's a vector. That's how we get into a school. It's like, we have this program that your kids are going to love. We're in there. And then we say, like, hey, while we're here, see how much fun that kids are having? You should run your class like this, and we can teach you how. So, so um, it's kind of cool. And then, actually, too, when the kids come to campus and they see this experience, they tell their, student, their teachers, you need to get this team to our school. We get into the school, then we talk to the teachers, and then we try to kind of change what they're doing and uh, it's been a it's been a really interesting journey that's so fulfilling though too because you just see all that you know it's almost a feedback loop in a sense right it just keeps going yes. and going and going and it's wonderful it so I'm curious because I'm, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit on you and talk about your teaching in general you know uh -huh. you the way I talk to people about you as a professor is you specialize in people who are afraid or confused by physics and, and correct me if I'm wrong but I'm curious how how you approach that and and how you work with that. That's an interesting that's an interesting point. You know, and my teaching is very much informed by the little shop of physics. Like, if you asked me when I was your age, what do you want to do for your career? I would have said, number one, I don't want to teach. But if I end up teaching, I don't want to teach at a big state school. And I ended up teaching at the state school. The one course I will never teach is the course for physics, physics for the life science students. I won't mm -hmm. teach that course. Like, <laughs> I, I want people who have already decided that physics is interesting and, and exciting. I don't want to have to sell people on that. I just like I, I didn't think I could do that. But I started teaching this course in physics for the life sciences after a decade of doing a little shop of physics, and then I had developed this passion for opening people's eyes for a different way of looking at the world. And I had a chance to interact with a bunch of people all over the world and think about how they teach this particular science. And then it became this mission for me, like I'm gonna take a group of people who coming into this course, they find it intimidating, they find it scary, they're expecting it to be very math intensive, very complex. And I'm gonna to try to sell it to them and make them understand like this is awesome and it's cool, and you can do this. You can 100% do this. And so I have to sell this idea of, of belief and self-efficacy. And um, my experience with the Little Shop of Physics really allowed me to do that. And I think if I hadn't had those experiences, uh, I, I, I would not have been able to do it. 
Yeah, I don't blame you. But I mean, it, it helps to have, and maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, it helps to work with children first and then oh, yeah. move to, to the college students. Absolutely. Absolutely. A decade ago, I got this award from the American Association of Physics Teachers. I got to give this big lecture at a national meeting. And my title was Everything I Need to Know About Science Teaching I Learned in Kindergarten. <laughs> and and it, it's a play on a title of a book, like Everything I Need to Know About Life I Learned in Kindergarten. But it's mm -hmm. like, and I started by saying, like, working with kindergartners, like, really, like, little kids um, really taught me how to approach this. Like, I can't use the big words, and I can't just immediately jump into a calculus description. I've got to first connect with them and, 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 and show them that, like, I'm someone who can be trusted. I'm presenting something that's interesting. And once they've bought in, I'm going to give it to them in language they can understand. And having that experience, and not just working with young kids, but working with kids in, oh, you know, cultures that run from, you know, sand people in Namibia to Navajo kids in the United States to, you know, kids in inner city Denver. I mean, we, we've had all these amazing experiences. And so being able to adapt that approach to different audiences really set me up for success in the general physics classroom. Like I said, I'm going yeah. to approach it the same way. I'm just going to meet you at your level. I'm going to teach you like I'm someone who can be trusted. I, I really care about you. Um, this stuff is awesome and you can do it and I'm going to present it to you in a way that you can understand and we're going to do baby steps so that, until you develop the content that you need to continue. And I've tried to keep that spirit. Sure. No, and, and as a previous student, I can definitely attest that you have that. And it's wonderful to see that in a classroom because, I mean, it's very rare for teachers to have that sort of mission that you do. What would you say to somebody who maybe is coming into your class or, or just a general person who's like, you know, I know basic physics, like E equals MC squared or something like that, but it seems really mathy or really scary. What would you say to somebody like that to kind of get them more interested? I think what I typically would try to do with people is to say, like, tell me something you're interested in. And, and, it, and then if you tell me something you're interested in, I'll tell you something that you maybe didn't know about that field. And I'll say there's a physics reason behind that. And don't you find that interesting? That's my hook. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find something you like. Um, and with the life science students they work with, um, my hook is, let's talk about the living world. So I was working on my syllabus today, and, and, and I, I start by giving them a whole bunch of just tidbits. Like I'll say, okay, hummingbirds have these bright colors, but the only pigment they have is brown. So how do you get green? How do you get red? The only pigment you have is brown. How do you make that happen? We'll talk. And I just want to like put these hooks out and say, you'll be able to understand this, and, and we will present this in a way where you, you can kind of like see where this comes. But I want to get that hook, that wonder first. Sure. And that, that's how I would start. Start with the wonder. No, that's a good hook. And so as far as just kind of a last question, where can people find Little Shop of Physics? Like, let's say that they want to just follow what you guys are doing. Where yeah. where would they find it? Oh, yeah. Um, best thing to do would just be go to our website. And we have links to all the different. I mean, we have, we're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We have, we're, you know, all those that we actually have a TikTok channel which we're going to get more active with in the <laughs> spring. Um, but just do a web search on Little Shop of Physics. You'll find, our, you'll find us, go to our webpage, and you have links to all the different things that we do. And one place people can immediately start um, following us, every Friday we do this Zoom program called Little Shop of Physics Live, and we've been doing this with the local schools, and that's a really good way to kind of like get a taste of the sort of things that we do. That's wonderful. And, uh, yeah, anybody can, anybody can join.